Welcome everyone to the latest edition of Cross Chat. This is our third edition of Cross Chat Books. And we will be talking about a book that you can see in the background of our guest already, Cross for Good. And the author of that book is Alessio Terzi, who works for the European Commission, but who has written this book in his personal capacity. Alessio did his PhD at the Hertie School in Berlin, Germany, and then spent some time in Harvard. And actually also the book appears with Harvard University Press. And it's an exciting read, I must say. So I read it in the last uh, few days in its entirety. And we are excited to have you, Alessio. Welcome. Thank you very much, Sasha. Thank you. So uh, to get us starting, would you just want to summarize the book for us? So what's the book about? So the book starts with uh, from a realization. And the realization is that um, many people, and especially in my generation, so millennials and to a certain extent uh, Gen Z, are deeply unhappy, let's say, with some elements of capitalism, if you want to uh, use uh, grand uh, words, or the way the economy is working, and in a way also about economic growth. And the criticism or argument sort of proceeds on two paths. The first path or a line of attack is on the environmental front. And so it's, it goes around the lines of, you know, economic growth as we've known it, industrialization and so on is responsible um, for the massive CO2 emissions that we've seen over the past 200 years and therefore for climate change and for a host of other environmental bads. And then on top of that, you have a second leg of the argument, which is, you know, to a large extent, the growth we have seen over the past 30 years, especially in certain countries, has accrued mostly to the top 1% uh, or to the wealthiest. And so if you combine these two arguments, what you see is something that is harming the planet. It is only good or mostly good for people who already have a lot and not for for the wider public, and therefore, what is its point? And this is a bit the, what the economist has called a few years back the millennial socialist um, attack or criticism of society. And, and this is a bit where I start. And therefore, that's how the book uh, reflects on, on these issues, which, again, it's sort of two intertwined questions. The first being, what is economic growth? Um, does it matter? Why does it matter? Has it always mattered or is it just a political obsession? Is it a recent phenomenon? Uh, perhaps it mattered early on in early stages of development, but by now it's no longer that important. And the second part is what is the relationship between the economy, economic growth and nature? And so if it's true that our current economy uh, or current growth based on fossil fuels is harmful to nature, is it possible to envision a different type of, of economy that it's not and that it's actually compatible with nature? And to answer this, I, I sort of went down a rabbit hole uh, reading across literatures from, from economic history to sociology to, to philosophy at some point uh, um, to anthropology. So I really tried to bring all uh, the literature I could find that was attacking these problems from various sides bring it together and re-emerge uh, with a deeper understanding of how um, society works or the economy is, is organized the way it is. Um, the book is, is broad, you've read it. And, and so I believe there are various points that come up, but if I had to really summarize in one line, the conclusion or the, the, the point that I reach, it is that, you know, in a way, capitalism and, and liberal democracy can be um, useful and can be enrolled in the fight against climate change. They can be a precious ally. And, uh, and once we do that, so once we reshape capitalism, to, to quote uh, the subtitle of my book, uh, this will uh, produce uh, growth. It will produce a different type of growth. Uh, I would define a good growth, uh, or to use uh, you know common slogans, it would be a green growth type of model. Uh, but this is not going to happen on its own, or maybe it would happen on, on its own, but it would take very long. And instead, we know that we are acting against a timeline, 
that is defined by climate scientists. And so we know we need to reach, let's say, climate neutrality by mid-century. And so we have to speed this up, this transition up. And for this, of, co of, of course, you need government policies, and I speak about that extensively, but you also need to have uh, proactive business uh, on board. And crucially, you also need consumers slash citizens. And only when society comes together and sees this as a societal mission, then is this possible and, and it can be done. And that's a bit how the book uh, is. Yeah. So as I read it, well, the key takeaway for me was that you say there is not really a trade-off between rescuing the planet from uh, environmental collapse and growth. But you even argue we have to grow in order to rescue the planet. So maybe you could elaborate a bit more on that point. Um, yeah, I, I, I come to the conclusion that in a way, growth is, is something that helps, um, helps society to thrive. It helps to avoid conflict over limited resources. And, and so that it can be a force for good and that shelving it uh, is not gonna do us any good. And actually that innovation is just another side of economic growth. And because we're gonna need extensive innovation in order to achieve our climate targets, we will produce uh, economic growth. And so ditching one would, uh, would sort of doom us and not get us any closer to the objectives we set for ourselves. Yeah. So um, I personally always found the idea of writing a book a daunting task. <laughs> so how come that you decided at some point, I'm going to write a book? So this book is, um, I won't lie, it's very much of a pandemic uh, project. Uh, these days, uh, people talk about um, you know, pandemic babies uh, as uh, babies that were born out of the pandemic lockdowns. And if we look at the book as a brainchild, in a way, this is my uh, pandemic, uh, uh, pandemic uh, product or child. Uh, but I mean, beyond uh, beyond uh, beyond jokes, I think uh, there is some truth in the fact that you remember in the early stages of when the pandemic started, uh, we were under harsh lockdowns at home. Uh, because uh, authorities were trying to contain the spread of this unknown uh, disease. And in doing that, um, the economy collapsed. And uh, if, if we had to look for a silver lining, it could have been the fact that, to use popular parlance, it looked like nature was healing. And so you had improving air quality, you had improving... Um, uh, uh, water quality, you had uh, plummeting CO2 emissions. Uh, you might recall at some point also on social media, there were these pictures of uh, dolphins in Venice. Now these were shown at some point to be uh, fabricated. Uh, but the point, the wider point remained or stuck with me, which is sort of bringing me to this reflection of, but could it be that beyond the pandemic, so even after this virus is gone, could it be that we have to necessarily curtail the economy in order to do some good to nature. And, uh, and that's how, that's how the, the, the project started. And that's how I started writing the book. Now, of course, this also builds on, on previous work I have done. My PhD was on economic growth. And so I have been reflecting uh, extensively on this, on this topic. And I, I, I was building on some elements of a papers I had already written, but that's how uh, that's how it started. Uh, I was mentioning to Marco before we started this talk that I was working, I started working at the European Commission in 2019. And one of the projects I was working on was the so-called Beyond GDP agenda. And so I wrote a paper on that and started reflecting on what is GDP? Why do we measure it? Uh, what if we stopped measuring it? What would it what happen? Or would we still have growth? Uh, is there a better way of measuring the economy or or the limits to what GDP can, can capture. Uh, and so all these reflections were, were already there. And then to a certain extent, the final point is that I am Italian and uh, Italy is a country that throughout my lifetime effectively has seen basically no real growth. Um, and so as Italians and especially uh, 
somebody that hasn't seen uh, growth for the past 30 years, you're, you're sort of primed, I believe, as an economist perhaps, to reflect on uh, like what happens when you are in a steady state type of economy and what type of dynamics are unleashed. Uh, and so I think that also contributed uh, to this, this reflection. Amazing. Um, I really enjoyed the book, by the way. Um, uh, the part because that you're Italian. Yeah? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can't relate to the story about growth. <laughs> uh, the part of the book that I particularly found interesting was the future of growth um, in a more green world. What was the part that you liked the most to write or you were more passionate about? So, it's, um, I find it's, it's a bit of a difficult question. I feel like uh, when you ask parents, uh, what is your favorite child? Uh, that, uh, again, to continue the metaphor of, uh, of a grandchild. Uh, because to me, um, every chapter has a function. So I started with a set of questions and it was sort of an intellectual journey. When I, when I speak to, to friends or I've spoken to other people who wrote books and authors, I've realized that that many people generally have a message in mind. So they know what they want to say, and then they sort of build a book around it, uh, building the, the, the argument or the, the line of reasoning. And to me, it wasn't like that. So it, it really started with a genuine question without knowing where this journey would have taken me. And so each chapter is a, a bit of the intellectual journey I took from uh, what is wrong uh, uh, with the current economy, be it inequality or be it the environmental dimension, and, and all the way to how can this be made better? Uh, but I realized that I'm sort of evading your question. So if I really had to pin down one chapter that I, I really liked, I, I have to admit I have a bit of a soft spot for, uh, for chapter five, which is called the true origins of, of the growth imperative. Because for me, it was really a, a revealing chapter. Um, it's the one where I understood that growth is not a goal per se, or something that the system, if you want to call it capitalism, imposes on people, but rather it is a byproduct of a system that delivers on people's needs and wants. And that therefore what propels economic growth is ever expanding uh, desire for needs and wants, for, for new needs and wants and, and better um, living standards. And this sort of turns uh, uh, the conventional wisdom around there, especially outside of economic circles. There is this persuasion that, you know, we have this obsession with growth and it is the obsession with growth that then leads us to hyper consumerism or hyper consumption. And in a way, my argument or what I realize in this chapter five is, is that it's all the way, it's upside down, right? I turn this argument on its head and it is out, rather the desire for more uh, and better and higher living standards that propels growth rather than the other way around. And so in the long term, if we wanna use economist uh, lingo, after all uh, uh, it is growth chats we are doing uh, today, I would say, or I would conclude that it is demand that determines the supply in the long run, rather than the other way around. Um, or that, you know, this is a, it's sort of says law, but upside down. Um, and this, is, this argument comes out in, in chapter five. And in order to make it, I go through, uh, or, or to make it in a persuasive way, especially for not necessarily an economist audience, I try to go through historical evidence to understand throughout history whether people uh, wanted more and why was that the case. And so I, I, I delve deep into uh, sociology and trying to understand the relationship between preferences and people living in a, in a society and how uh, basic human cultural traits work and the desire to fit in and the desire to stand out and the desire to self-express and how this feeds uh, the 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 ultimately the need or the desire for more. Yeah, you mentioned like the difference between, well, like we're all economists here. At the end, we, we found the economic part uh, the most interesting, I will say, you know, supply and demand. It's like, you know, the dynamics and the history of growth. But what do you think unknown economists will find most interesting? Like, I think you already partially answered this question, but 
looking at the chapters of your book, what part do you think a non-economist will find most interesting? So uh, I, I think the opportunity of you asking this question to, to make a broader point, which is that this book was not written only or even primarily uh, with economists in mind. Um, there's nothing excessively technical in it. Everything that is uh, more technical ruminations or uh, references to the literature uh, and so on, they're all pushed uh, into the end notes, in part also due to a discussion I had with my editor or my publisher. And so the end notes are very long, but the book is the body of, of the book is actually relatively short, it's 200 pages, there's nothing technical in it. And so the only thing that is required is uh, to, to appreciate it, uh, I believe, is an interest in climate change and in wanting to understand what this will do or how this interacts with the economy and society. So it's a very broad, um, a broad uh, definition of, uh, of uh, what people might appreciate. But if you really um, want me to, to sort of hint at what I believe a, a non-technical reader would appreciate. I believe it is the fact that in a relatively compact book, so in 200 pages more or less, you, you have the piecing together of a lot of literature, as I said, in order to build the bottom up a coherent view of why nature is, or nature and society and or the economy interact in the way they do. And so a better understanding of, of our economic system. Um, and in a way also where this is heading. Uh, so there's also a, a dimension of, of predictions. They're very loose predictions and long-term predictions, uh, but of what will happen to, um, let's say, climate in, the impact of, of climate on the economy, the interactions between countries as climate change starts materializing, the, what is credible for climate negotiations, um, in what way will the economy transform uh, as we try to uh, stave off uh, climate catastrophe. So this, I believe, is the greatest uh, asset, perhaps, uh, of the book for a non-economist uh, non uh, reader. Thank you. Uh, well, last question I have is, what did you learn? When writing a book, I guess like everyone learns something writing papers, doing research. What was your takeaway? Again, it's uh, it's a bit of a tough uh, tough question because uh, because I learned uh, I, I really learned a lot um, because as I was mentioning, I started with a few papers in mind, but I don't have forty years of research uh, in uh, in the bag that I could just piece together and write a book. Uh, so I had a few islands of knowledge here and there, but then to connect them and, and form a coherent view required a lot of work, and 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 that was uh, that was really um, a discovery for me. Uh, but again, if if I had to make a broad statement of one thing I learned, I would say that it is uh, the importance of um, let's say keeping an open mind and being open to new ideas and understanding and and in a way what I did with this book was a bit play the game of why so the game of why is as in uh, you might recall maybe you did it as well with your parents when you were a kid that uh, you would constantly ask why it's like you've got to go to bed and why do I have to go to bed yeah, because you've got to wake up tomorrow morning and why do I have to wake up tomorrow morning because you've got to go to school and why do I have to go to school to learn new things meet new friends and why do I have to make new friends and so I sort of this did this, uh, this game with myself of not giving anything for granted. And I would say that also as, a, as, a, as an economist, it sort of pushed me outside of my comfort zone because uh, to give you an example, what we do as economists generally is that um, we take preferences as given. And so generally we have this idea that, you know, there is non-satiation, there might be satiation obviously on one specific dimension, so there are decreasing marginal returns, uh, but but effectively, overall, there is uh, this idea that more is better. And we model preferences of, uh, of, uh, of people, of households in our basic micro, micro models as, like that. But we don't, 
question this. We, we, we can show it, we can have empirical evidence that proves that this is the case, but it is what it is and we take it for granted. And at least, uh, you know, in mainstream economics, uh, since embracing uh, Jeremy Bentham's uh, utilitarianism, we, we just take them for what they are. And instead, I, I sort of tried to start wondering, for example, but why is that the case? And uh, since when is that the case? And uh, is it true only in Western uh, uh, type of countries where we've seen uh, all this growth? Or is it true more broadly? And why is that? Um, and so the game of wise has really taken me places. Uh, sometimes uncomfortable places, but I, I, I overall enjoyed the, the, the experience. And so the greatest learning for me has been really to, to keep a broad open mind to a variety of topics, but also a variety of literatures and approaches that are different. And again, maybe that's also a bit of an economist bias. You know that we have a tendency, or at least we're accused of, of being a bit narrow in our focus on our literature, on our discipline, and, and being a bit shut to the, to the outside world. And, and instead, that's a bit what I've learned of trying to make the most uh, of also other literatures that can help us understand how, how the world works. So let me ask you about uh, your readership. Um, so on the one hand, I guess, as an author, you just would be happy if your book hit somehow some, some list of top uh, readings, um, bestseller lists. Um, but uh, if you could pick a type of reader, who would you be most happy with? Or who do you think would benefit from your book um, a lot and uh, would make you happy hearing that certain people liked it? So as I said, the, the reader... I, I think it's a book that uh, that appeals to a very general reader. And maybe the, the only requirement to have is to have an interest in understanding the way society works and, uh, or, and how it could work. So it, it's what we would uh, call perhaps like an interest in politics, uh, very loosely defined. Um, and then obviously have an interest in climate change. But if I, if I really had to drill down uh, into demographics or categories that I think would appreciate uh, the book. Um, I sort of mentioned at the beginning, I, I, it started from the realization that millennials and Gen Z to a certain extent are unhappy with the, with the current model. And I'm realizing that more and more uh, people in this age cohort are losing hope in uh, capitalism and liberal de and democracy and liberal democracy in delivering on uh, climate action. I was teaching in Paris uh, last week and, and I saw it vividly in students, even in a business school, which is not the natural uh, revolutionary environment perhaps that uh, one would expect. Uh, but I saw a lot of, uh, of, uh, of sort of loss of hope in, uh, in democracy and delivering on these things. And, and I, I, I would really hope uh, to, for, for these uh, readers to delve into my book and perhaps regain some, uh, some hope. And another group I, I'm particularly interested in is perhaps scientists, um, climate scientists, but scientists in general that have been working or work on elements related to climate change. And the reason for this is that I believe that for many of them, this is, they have an interest in, uh, in obviously in nature and, and the planet, and they have a deep understanding of what is needed. Uh, and where we have to, to get by a certain deadline and what the risks are, but perhaps not necessarily they've spent a lot of time on what are the implications of this uh, for the economy and society and how can we design this in a way that it is realistic and that it can happen uh, and so that it is economically possible, politically possible, uh, socially possible. And, and so I think that those are also people that would uh, that would appreciate uh, this book. Yeah. Um, so what I noticed when reading the book and uh, also in this interview, you are a very hopeful, optimistic person, and uh, you um, don't see doom and gloom. Um, you see challenges, but the, these challenges of climate change can be addressed. So maybe as my final question, let me ask you, what, what makes you so optimistic? So uh, what is it that you think will help humanity turn the curve and turn a corner and uh, address climate change? I think part of the optimism 
um, originates from a reading of, uh, of history, of long-term history of, uh, of humanity, or the journey of humanity, as Odette Galor would, uh, would call it, and just realizing that throughout our history, we, we as humans uh, have faced uh, many, a multifold of these challenges, often actually in conversation or in clash with nature, with extreme weather events, with droughts, with floodings, and with much less tools than we had or that we have right now, with much less technology, uh, with much less uh, science. And, uh, and the, the reason why we went from, um, you know, one mid-sized uh, mammal among many on this planet to the top of the, of the food chain is that we have managed to leverage some of our evolutionary traits in our favor. Uh, but at the same time, I don't want to be the Dr. Pangloss of, uh, of climate change. So I, I do realize that, uh, that this is a, a different scale of challenge. Um, so it is the same type, but a different, on a different scale, because obviously the whole uh, planet's atmosphere is changing with, uh, with deep repercussions uh, and a variety of things. Um, but at the same time, our tools are, are stronger and our, uh, our science is, is stronger in this respect. So I would say that it is definitely feasible, but I, I wouldn't want anybody to come out of this book saying, you know, I can sit back, relax, and everything is going to take care of itself. This is not the message I want uh, for people to come out with, but rather that only with an active engagement and it is the sum of the small parts of everybody in society doing their small bit that will uh, lead us to, uh, to a future that is, uh, that is better than uh, the doom and gloom that you were talking about. Thank you so much, Alessio. So uh, there is more and more on the reading list of people in the year 2022. It's interesting that this year, so many books on crows, uh, one way or another, are coming out. So we covered Odette Galore's uh, journey of uh, humanity that you mentioned, and then also the, the work by Jared Rubin and Makoyama, and now your book, which is maybe the one that uh, is most concerned about where are we going and is growth sustainable in the future, and uh, all three of them uh, together as a bundle are definitely worth a read. So thanks so much for joining us today, Alessio, and I hope many people pick up your book. It's really an enjoyable read, 200 pages, uh, easy going, and you will enjoy it. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Alessio, and thank you, Sasha, for running the interview. I'll see you the next one.